Hi there, am I coming through okay for you guys? Everyone can hear me in the back? Awesome. Uh, well, if you made it this far, thank you guys for getting through the day. We're on the, the up and up. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, my focus today is kind of uh, what my perspective tends to be, which is the ramifications of what happens early on um, and what our hopes would be to try and prevent this stuff from happening. So what, uh, before I dive into some of the particular details, just wanted a quick disclosure here that um, I might show products and companies and whatnot, but I am not affiliated with anything that you might see. So I have no kind of uh, financial uh, disclosure. What I'm hoping to cover over the next 45 minutes or so um, is to talk about our impact on behavior and hopefully our ability to prevent problems from occurring, um, to understand the differences and how those might impact the development of behavior over time as the puppy grows and develops through its multiple stages of uh, behavior, and then to justify some of the importance of the socialization and the integration into puppy care. Um, and then some recommendations, if we have time, which I don't think we will, on uh, ways that we might be able to meet some of those needs, especially to prevent some of the common behavior problems uh, that tend to occur over, uh, over on as they get older. Um, I have realized as we've been chatting, uh, getting to know a bunch of you guys over this uh, morning or so, uh, that you guys are way more savvy than where most of these things tend to uh, be helpful. Um, so most of my presentations tend to focus more uh, towards an audience of veterinary students or veterinarians where they don't have experience when it comes to actually raising these puppies and seeing what they are when they grow up. Um, so I am hoping that either you guys can just zone out for the next 45 minutes um, and enjoy your chill pill uh, for this time, or you can recognize how little information the general population actually knows about some of these things. And the fact that there is this discrepancy of education where you guys have the ability to say, all right, what's common knowledge to us it's definitely not common knowledge to them. So how can we make sure that even though it's super obvious, can we go through the extra effort to make sure that communication is translated so that they are more empowered to continue the things that you've built so much into these puppies uh, for the rest of their lives? And although we are focusing on dogs, because that's what you got me here for, um, I can't ignore my love of cats. Um, so there will be a little bit of that sprinkled in uh, just because I can't help myself. So I do apologize for that. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so uh, I'll jump on my soapbox as I will every so often because it's hard to be up here literally without jumping on our own soapboxes. Uh, but I did want to share that behavior problems are the number one reason for relinquishment um, of our pet population, uh, which again, as a reminder, my tend to focus or my usual focus is on companion animals, those that want to be in the home as more of the pet piece. Um, I don't know necessarily some, or I haven't dived into if there is much literature looking at other functions such as, you know, the working line or show dogs or things along those lines. But what we have a lot more information is those that are usually companion animals being relinquished to shelters. And by and far, behavior is our main issue. 47% of dogs that are relinquished to shelters at the time of this slightly older study, the 98s, um, is due to behavior problems. So that's a large, practically 50% of dogs that were showing up at that time because of behavior. When it comes to veterinarians, this is a little bit of an earlier survey. Uh, one of the number one leading causes of requests for euthanasia is because of behavior. So that's a lot of lost dogs potentially because of this quote unquote simple issue uh, that we may be able to avoid because the vast majority of these behavior problems are likely preventable. Uh, if we could have better education of our uh, clients to understand what is important to the canine species or feline species, uh, what is normal natural behavior, uh, so that they can have a better judgment of what is going to be a better fit into their lives, as well as how could they try and either continue the great efforts that you guys might have invested into your puppies into their new home and their new lifestyle. Um, as well as them recognizing some of the issues that might not work well for them so that they could seek help earlier on until it is too late. So you guys as breeders or hobby breeders or anything, or, and then my group of veterinarians tend to be in that uh, really unique position to educate, to potentially be that sounding source of reliable information that owners could come to, to look for that level of support and guidance in the future. So that we're less likely to see, especially in my field, uh, in veterinary clinics where we see these guys uh, come in where they're really fearful, really, and they may escalate to things like aggression, um, to instead creating a more confident, comfortable, resili resilient dog in the home that we hope they're going to stay in for the longer period of time. 
With the vast majority of things in veterinary medicine, our main goal is prevention. We're going to have a lot more success that if we can prevent it, then we'll be less likely to have those issues early on than if we didn't put in the extra effort like vaccinations um, to, to try and just to treat the actual disease process once it develops. And that's the same thing with behavior. If we can prevent the actual development of behavior problems, we'll have a lot better outcome. Um, and that and it helps to look for some of those earlier signs uh, that you guys might be able to detect even before they get into the client's home. As we've talked at length uh, throughout these earlier hours, there are so many factors that can influence what the actual behavior ends up being in the future. We've talked a lot about genetics early on, as well as dabbling a bit about epigenetics and how the interplay of all of that can potentially ram uh, can manifest later on. Um, it reminds me of a really early, early on study of how even early stressors that uh, were many generations in the past could continue to influence the offspring down the road. So there was a study, I'd, sorry, I forgot to pull it, um, but there was a study looking at rats and how the grandmother and the stress or the shock that they had while they were pregnant with the eventual um, mother still had ramifications that happened with that mother's offspring. So there is a lot of these things that can continue to, to compound in the future. And then we know that there's a lot of early life um, both stimulation as well as cognitive learning history that can impact their future behavior. And it's not like it just stops at any point. They're going to continue to learn and continue to take that feedback over time. Um, and so all of those life experiences are going to determine what their future behavior is going to be. So I want to take a little repeat, preve, um, and talk about puppy development. All of this should be old hat for the vast majority, if not all of you. Um, but I want to kind of put a little bit of a spin on it from a veterinary behaviorist standpoint on what I'm particularly looking at um, for mainly my main focus of behavior um, at each of these developmental stages. So you guys are likely familiar with many of these stages that a puppy might go through as they're growing. So we've got the neonatal, we've got the transitional, we've got socialization, juvenile, adolescence, and social maturity. I'll go through each of these a little bit fairly briefly today, so I won't bore you too much. With the neonatal, these are from birth till roughly 10 days of age. Uh, we're all probably very familiar that they're incredibly dependent on the bitch for absolutely everything that they need for, from thermal reg thermoregulation to nutrition and elimination. During this stage, they're not getting much environmental stimulation because they can't hear or uh, see during this stage. So they are kind of a little bit less able to make any cognitive changes during this phase, but neurology is always developing during these phases. And then we get the transitional phase from roughly 11 days to 21 days of age. Um, and this is where their eyes and ears start to open. So they're starting to take in a little bit more information from their environment. They're starting to be able to uh, regulate their own temperature on their own and eliminate on their own. So this being transitional, they're going from deaf and blind to starting to be a bit more independent um, and starting to make some of those connections, but it's still not going to be very rock solid. Then socialization, this has a fairly wide window in the, it's not entirely concrete, but it is estimated about three weeks of age, it could start that early. And if you're lucky, it might make it all the way to 16 weeks. Uh, there's a little bit of discrepancy on where that might fall. Um, and during this phase, uh, this is when these guys tend to be a bit more exploring beyond the nest that a standard pup would make. So they're gonna be a little bit more exploratory, but not all the way of being independent in their own environment. This is where social learning and play really increase, both with their own conspecifics, their litter mates, their mother, as well as with objects. We get a big rise in object play. It goes by a bunch of different names, including the sensitive period, but this is where they start to learn that everything that they're encountering could potentially be safe and normal and a typical life, um, but they're still fairly sheltered. So they're not necessarily in, uh, interacting with true threats. So they're much more likely to kind of um, interact with the world, might encounter some stressors, but know that they can move through it because they should be in a fairly sheltered area based on kind of their mother's uh, nurturing, air, um, nurturing guidance. Some of the discrepancy on where that socialization window quote unquote ends um, has been, there's been a couple of studies looking at our, what sort of influences might be seen between these particular kind of breeds or in individual variances. So this study in particular looked at three different breeds and a very small subset of Yorkies versus German Shepherds versus uh, Cavies um, and found that uh, different 
fear was more likely to manifest at certain different periods of time, depending on each di different breed. And there seemed to be some variances there with maybe some of them having a shorter window of tolerance, uh, potentially the German shepherds in this particular study might develop more fear earlier on compared to the cabbies that might be a little bit more relaxed until a little bit of a later onset. So that's where we get kind of this window of maybe the socialization window starts to uh, shift into the next developmental stage between 12 weeks of age and 16 weeks of age. One little note uh, that I know we have this buzz phrase kind of talked about uh, often is this idea of a fear period. Uh, and you might have recognized that I didn't include that in the list. Um, and that's because it's not necessarily a true developmental phase. It's not to say that the puppies are going to go through this phase. Uh, fear can develop at any point throughout these whole processes. Sometimes there may be some sensitivity maybe starting in the socialization developmental phase where we get some puppies that are a little bit more worried and then they work through it. But oftentimes we can still see that pop up even further into juvenile and even into adolescence. So it's not necessarily a true de developmental stage, but there may be some of that kind of worry and caution that kind of ebbs and flows. So that's why this can be a little bit controversial um, depending on uh, who you talk to. Regardless, when we are in the sensitive pay phase or the socialization period, if they do have a traumatic event, that might have a much more longer um, consequence because this is where one of some of their biggest learning happens. So then we move on from socialization into juvenile, which is about three months to six months of age. So this is where they're going to be much more independent. They're going to even go further away from their nest and be more likely to encounter actual threats uh, that could potentially injure them. So they're a lot more physical. They're a lot more out there, a lot more independent. Um, and this is where we tend to be more appropriately encountering fear, because if they are encountering something novel during this phase, they should be afraid of it if they want to preserve their survival. Uh, because they're going to be into more of those uh, concerning locations. And this is also a challenge uh, bec uh, with their level of learning. Uh, and that's where we get a lot of frustration with many of our clients is things can be really nonlinear. Some days these dogs might be on top of it. They know what they're doing. They are rock star trainers. And then the next day it's like we're at ground zero. They know absolutely nothing. And that level of inconsistency can be really confusing um, and frustrating from some clients. Uh, but this is really important to recognize that we will see that what we're essentially looking for is in general, what is tra the trajectory over time? Are we seeing on average, they are doing better and better and better? Or are we constantly seeing this ebb and flow and not making a lot of progress over time? And then adolescence, oh boy, the teenager, teenage years. Uh, so then we, this is usually around six months to roughly two-ish years of age, kind of depending on individuals and uh, potentially breed and breed line influences. Um, this is where they start to reach sexual maturity and carry that on so long as they have all their uh, physical stuff. Um, where we, This is oftentimes, at least as a veterinarian, where we get the onset of most of the behavior problems. Things that were kind of cute before, where they were cute little puppies and mouthy or people were roughhousing them. These are now bigger dogs and those behaviors are no longer tolerated, but they've had X number of months learning and reinforced for those unwanted behaviors until now. Um, and so this is often the time where where they might reach out to me or they start to identify that this is the period of time where all of those issues really started to rear their ugly head. And then we get to social maturity. And so at this stage, it's roughly two years, could start anywhere as early as one year, potentially as late as five years, depending on the individual patient. Um, and at this point, this is where they are a bit more uh, of themselves. They've got their clear expression of who they are, their typical behavior, and they're a lot more consistent from a day-to-day -day standpoint. We get less of that volatility and nonlinear learning. It's a bit more consistent. They're also a little less flexible to pick on the things that we're trying to teach them um, compared to their earlier months. So this is where they're a little bit more set in their ways, but that doesn't mean that they can't learn. They definitely can still learn. All right, all of that should be fairly review, uh, but I did want to take a quick little note on the kitten aspect and just put it as a side by side comparison. So if we got puppies on one column and we got kittens on the other, some of the timeline uh, can fairly match up. 
Um, and they go through all of those similar developmental stages. The one big key difference, especially when it comes to, uh, to our consideration, is that socialization period. It's often earlier, um, at about that two-week mark to eight to nine weeks, if you're lucky, for those kittens, um, largely due to the fact that they're not nearly as domesticated as dogs. So they don't have several thousands of years where they have been connected to us. Um, they also are, have a very flexible social structure, so they're not as dependent to interact with us. Um, so that's definitely really important to keep in mind for any cat breeders. I don't know if we have any in our audience today. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, yeah, I got a cat friends in my midst. Um, so when we think about that, uh, the big takeaway is the vast majority of our kittens are being rehomed at that eight week mark. Um, at least that's the most common practice in most shelters. Um, and so at that point, their window or their biggest sensitive uh, critical period has mostly kind of moved on. So they haven't had as much uh, potential to adapt to their new home and kind of learn what their life is supposed to be like uh, before they're there. But the good thing is, is learning continues to happen. It just might not be as flexible as it would be during that period. So I know we're all here for this particular subject, but just in case it wasn't super obvious what I was gonna talk about this hour, um, wanted to chat or wanted to ask the whole audience, what developmental stage has the biggest impact on preventing behavior problems? And we should all be ringing in our heads. That's probably the socialization. It's the big buzzword that is all around the media nowadays. So wanted to take a, again, a couple little minutes uh, and chat about why it's so special and why we care about this and why there's such a big buzzword about this idea of socialization. It goes by a couple of names that I know I've interplayed a little bit before, like sensitive period and critical period. But essentially during this developmental phase, this is when there is this a potential association that is at its strongest when there is a positive emotional exposure to environmental stimuli. And it must occur within this period of time, or we may, it may be really difficult for that patient to be able to be flexible with that in the future. Um, and it's going to have the biggest impact on their future behavior. So when we think about the socialization period, it's this short amount of time that essentially creates the behavior that that adult dog will eventually manifest. And just because it's so important, it must have a positive emotional response in order to adapt to what their world is going to be. So what happens when we fail and they are not able to have the breadth of what their life is going to be within that critical time period? The likelihood is that they're going to learn that anything novel beyond that time period should be something that they're afraid of, because that could mean that it's a threat to their life. We know that there's been a lot of past studies, really, really older study here, um, on some of these dogs that had been completely isolated from human interaction during that socialization period. And when then later exposed to people or other stimuli, they showed excessive fear compared to those that did have the opportunity to have some level of socialization. And we all probably have seen or are aware of some of the ramifications when they are not when we're not meeting a wide band of potentially emotionally positive experiences for those dogs. So if they didn't have exposure to strangers, then they're more likely to have struggles with things like guests or partners or changes in the household like children. If they didn't get to see other dogs, they may have interpet aggression or leash reactivity in the future or things along those lines where we have issues with other dogs. If they didn't get to see a variety of other animals in a positive light, they may have conflict or anxiety around those other animals. If they didn't see a variety of environments, they're going to be more likely to be anxious in those environments. Big one on my end tends to be veterinary clinics. And then when it comes to handling, then we have this intolerance to important procedures. And I was chatting with some of you guys before, and it sounds like you guys are on top of how we can build some of those procedures, like something as simple as a nail trim, and how incredibly valuable something as simple as that really is. Um, I say that because almost all of my patients do not tolerate having their, their feet touched, much less a nail trim. And that's one of the number, <laughs> one of the largest reasons, um, or at least the more common thing that I tend to see with the vast majority of the patients that I have to deal with. So hopefully that means they're not what you guys have been raising. Um, so pat yourselves on the back. You guys are, are definitely creating the, the better puppies out there. Um, and then I wanted to take a little minute uh, and chat a bit about some of the ramifications that we've been seeing in other contexts. We've got things like the pandemic, 
Um, and just as a quick side note, since we've been chatting about this before, uh, we also have the, the challenges of the, the discrepancy of where these clients are getting their dogs. Um, I know we shared earlier that we've got, you know, only so many, you know, appropriately bred and raised puppies, and then this huge, huge demand. And there's been this huge influx, at least that I have seen, of really inappropriately or uh, lack of any socialization from a lot of dogs that are coming from rural areas, from the Caribbean street dogs or the meat dog trade. Um, and the challenge that challenges is those dogs are likely emotionally really well equipped to be in those environments of being on the street or being a meat dog. Um, and so taking them out of those areas, they're not well equipped to be home companions, or they may really struggle to get to where the clients might hope to them to be. So in addition to that, then we have this whole issue that happened over the last few years. There's not a lot yet of published literature, but there is some. So I wanted to share with you just in the event that it made you curious, because it definitely made me curious. So what we do know about some of the pandemic puppies is where some of them have come from. So the vast majority of the owners that did get puppies during the pandemic had not initially even considered getting a puppy prior to the pandemic lockdowns. So we have a lot of people who probably didn't put a lot of thought. Um, again, I'm, I'm probably extrapolating, but might not have put a lot of thought as to the level of responsibility that was necessary for these potential puppies in the long term. Um, and most of them found that the decision, uh, or the, they were influenced by the pandemic itself, um, thinking that they would have a lot more time to raise the puppies and have a dog um, until they didn't. The other interesting thing, um, at least from my perspective, that I wanted you guys as breeders to be aware of is a lot of these owners were less likely to actually use breeders who did health testing. So they likely reached out to a lot of breeders um, that didn't have necessarily the level of dedication and care that they should have had with these potential puppies. Um, and the vast majority of them never viewed the puppy before they actually acquired the dog itself. Um, and you can just imagine <laughs> the, the issues that we can get with that lack of, lack of connection and understanding and lack of education with that population of dogs. Uh, the owners were more likely to be first time dog owners. So who didn't, who likely didn't know the ramifications of these decisions um, and weren't aware of some of the responsibilities that they would have. And they were also a lot of them having kids um, in the household, which is a potentially challenge um, of trying to manage all of those things and a puppy um, in a household that everyone's locked down in um, on top of that. The puppies themselves tend to be younger, uh, which you know, we tend to, the general stance is uh, rehoming dogs at about eight weeks of age. So we're thinking of even younger than that. Um, and the potential ramifications of them not having social interactions with their conspecifics, not really learning appropriate interactions within that stage before then they are also under lockdown in this uh, novel environment. They were often collected from a far distance away, so they'd go through travel that they may or may not be accustomed to, which could have induced a lot of fear um, through that transport. Um, and then they were often seen by that owner without even looking at their litter mates for comparison uh, when it comes to behavior. Some of the behavioral impacts of the pandemic uh, is that when the restrictions lifted and people could exit their house, we saw a rise in fear and aggression in this dog population. Um, and that we saw a lot of the fear and aggression being associated with these dogs that were acquired during this time period and likely didn't have appropriate socialization um, because they were kept so isolated uh, due to the lockdown itself. The other um, unsurprising ramification that we saw with some of these puppies and dogs is during the lockdown, when people were home, there were less signs of separation anxiety. They were a lot less distressed because there was a person there all the time. And then once the lockdown lifted or we started to be more flexible with what people uh, could do, then we started to see the rise of separation anxiety come back. Um, and there seemed unsurprisingly, was an association with dogs during the lockdown that had less departures were much more likely to develop separation anxiety in the future. So these dogs did not have the uh, appropriate positive interactions to gain independence um, until uh, they had no choice. All right, so little soapboxes there, but if you weren't familiar with uh, some of those pieces, just wanted to let you know what you might be dealing with with some of your friends um, who hopefully hopefully you're dealing with all your friends and they're able to, uh, to actually come to you for those suggestions, uh, but the general population are not aware of the issues um, that we need to, them to be aware of. So this lack of education is really um, a big problem. 
Uh, I know there's been a couple of questions throughout the course of the day about socialization and the windows, and I'll try and take any of those questions to the best of my ability. I also imagine the vast majority of Mass, the vast majority of you guys understand really the rest of these slides on what is important when it comes to socializing, but there may be some tidbits that might be valuable. Uh, so when it comes to how we socialize, we tend to look at the windows of emotional development um, of the socialization period. And for the most uh, majority of our puppies, they're oftentimes with their uh, mother or their litter mates. Particularly in the shelter setting, we start to make the transition into their forever home, usually around that eight week window. Um, and I know we've had debates on when we'd start to make that uh, transition, at least for our, our breeding population. Um, when it comes to kittens, once we reach that seven to eight week window, um, they're often uh, sent off. So that socialization window is closed once they get moving on. Some of our thoughts when it comes to socialization is we've got kind of two different flavors, um, which I think could be really helpful to keep in mind. We've got our active socialization, which the vast majority of the population, that's all they think about is this active process of, I need to get my dog out there. They need you right in the midst, um, such as this puppy on the left, uh, where they're right touching the children. They're right there. The noise is right in their ear. They're right on the surface, um, which can be very valuable as well. But passive socialization is also really important where they can survey at their own distance. They don't have to be physically in the midst to have positive associations with what's going on and be able to recognize and move through those scenarios. Um, it's also really important for them to learn a level of independence. So where they don't have to be physically touched by a person all the time. Um, so having this sort of balance uh, is really critical. And just as a side note, um, our clients, when they get these puppies, all they want to do is the active socialization. You know, they're excited to have a puppy. They want to have that puppy in their arms 24 seven, sleep with the puppy on their pillow and all of that. And so many of our problems, um, at least some of the treatment solutions could be really valuable if that patient was able to have some independence, to have nap time, to be comfortable in a crate for a certain amount of period. Um, so having that uh, interplay is really important, especially if you're going to counsel any of these new dog owners. Uh, you guys are likely well aware of how to recognize some of these earlier signs of fear, but let me tell you, clients do not. Um, they don't recognize unless it is in their face, barking, lunging, snarling, for them to recognize that ears back, tail down, stare um, are early signs of fear until a dog has to kind of scream it in their face on how uncomfortable they are. So these sorts of education is really valuable for them to know. Sometimes we need clear pictures that can cross language boundaries so that they can really recognize what are some of those subtle signs of fear so that they know ears back and lack of movement is really uncomfortable and maybe we should have a timeout. Maybe that puppy is really uncomfortable right now. That doesn't mean we have to end socialization, but can we advocate for what that puppy actually needs and give them the space um, or the time so they can have a bit of a break? So when it comes to socialization, it tends to be also very uh, based on an individual's response. So some puppies might be really interested. They want to engage. They want to be a part of that interaction. And we can see, such as in this image that I pulled here, we've got a puppy that has the choice. There's no leash. There's no restriction and chooses to opt to go towards this child. We've got a lot of soft facial features, uh, gentle staring, uh, as well as a positive association because we've got a treat dangling up there for that to be a true positive emotional response compared to what many of our clients view as socialization, which is let's just shove the puppy and get stuck with the child. So here we've got a child who wraps their arm around this puppy. Um, and they're like, oh, isn't that cute? The puppy is licking the child's face. And that is a puppy that is screaming, I'm really uncomfortable in this situation. Licking is often an appeasement behavior, well, depending on the context. But in this particular context saying, I really need more space. I'm not a threat. Please stop threatening me. So we've got a puppy here that's leaning away, ears back. We've got whale eye where we can see the whites of the eye on how this puppy is really trying to, to remove itself from the situation. So if there's anything that we could try and educate our future dog owners is socialization is not the same thing as exposure. Exposure just means I put puppy in thing and that's exposure. Socialization is a positive emotional change to that exposure. So it's kind of a subset. Um, and I think creating that clear clarity is really important and it's not gonna be the same for every individual dog. 
So some things we can think about to try and advocate for that individual puppy is going at that puppy's particular pace. So maybe that's a puppy that needs more space to survey the environment instead of being in the midst of it. Um, and although we do want quantity, seven, seven, seven surfaces in seven weeks, uh, 100 stimuli in 100 days, uh, quality is also probably potentially even more important. Um, both are important, don't get me wrong, uh, but quality of those experiences uh, are really something that we can't uh, chip away at. Because um, if we do 100 things in 100 days and it's terrified 100% of the time, we just traumatize that puppy. And not to say that any of you guys would do that. I'm just saying from our clients' perspectives, they don't understand the nuance necessarily unless we can clearly outline that to them. Um, and that's through no fault of their own. They really want what's best for the puppy. They just don't necess not necessarily understand that. Um, and then we need to be our puppy's bodyguard. Um, so recognizing those subtle signs of fear to say, okay, this has been enough of a duration, let's get a bit of a break or get some more space and then reassess the situation if we go back into that location or not. So when it comes to how we socialize, we all think of all the variety of things that that puppy might need in the future, uh, such as positive emotional responses to people, a variety of environments, sights, sounds, objects, essentially any sort of life skill that that puppy might need in the future. Um, and that's hard for you guys as breeders to fully know. Um, you don't know what necessarily next steps that that puppy is going to need to go through. Uh, we're not necessarily going to know what sort of expectations that that client wants for that puppy in the future, but having a variety can be helpful. We might not be able to do a hundred things, but building that level of resiliency to say, yep, there's a minor stressor and you can move through that is going to be really powerful for that puppy in the long run. I wanted to share this cute little video that a past veterinary technician created with her puppy um, when it came to a couple of varieties of procedures or stimuli that they uh, that this puppy was encountered with. Um, and some of the processes that we're using in this video is the concept of desensitization and counter conditioning. Um, so just as a quick recap of those words uh, is desensitization is we start the stimuli at a low level so that the puppy is not showing any signs of fear. So fully relaxed, able to move through that process. And then we gradually increase the intensity of the stimuli so long as they continue to remain relaxed. And then counter conditioning is pairing it with a positive emotional response of food in the vast majority of these uh, video clips. So we'll start here. It is sped up, so she does sound like a chipmunk. Assuming we have audio, which we might not. Uh, doesn't sound like we have audio. <laughs> Uh, so with this, uh, we've got the puppy in a bath, we're smearing some food, but the, the bath is not very full, we just have a little bit of water there to get the puppy used to the, uh, getting the, his feet wet, and he could have a good time kind of playing and chomping at the food there, instead of just dunking the dog under, under the water, not that we guys do that, um, but uh, we're just gradually building up the amount of tactile responses. In this video, if we had audio, we'd hear a vacuum. Uh, which the vast majority of our dogs are going to struggle with some of those loud noises, especially if we were to get a giant Rottweiler uh, to chase after a vacuum. And instead of just vacuuming right in front of the dog, what you would hear is the sound being in a separate room and then gradually building the intensity of the sound so long as the dog is still fully relaxed in their separate area. And here we can get to the point of a puppy in the vacuum in the same room and doesn't even pay it any mind. Um, so you guys are well uh, ahead of many of many of our uh, uh, many of our upcoming clients, but the the impact of socialization has continued to be stressed within some of our major veterinary groups. Um, still very new, with some of them being as late as 20, uh, 2015. So some has taken a little bit to get on the bandwagon, uh, but thankfully uh, many of our major organizations are there. Uh, you may ask, or your clients may ask, um, is it too late to socialize? Because we definitely have a lot of pet owners that will have older dogs and they're like, I take it to a dog park to socialize, um, which uh, the whole, I'm not going to get on that soapbox. We can have a debate later. Um, but uh, there is never too late to quote unquote socialize. Uh, the goal is again, a positive emotional response to something. Uh, but the socialization window closes in that earlier time period. They're going to continue to learn, but they may be a little bit slower and may not have as far, far of a resiliency as a young puppy during that socialization period. So to give you kind of a side-by-side -side comparison, we've got that cute little Rottweiler puppy during his socialization window, and we've got a two-ish year old female spade uh, mixed breed dog. Um, and both of them are going to be exposed in this video to a novel stimulus, which is bubbles. So I want you to take a look at the body language and how quickly we see one adapt to that change compared to the other. So bubbles are starting. You might notice that the 
older animal took space away and the puppy didn't even move because it's kind of quick in there in his face ready to kind of interact with what it's at and then we still have the older pup kind of hanging back from a distance watching lip lick of nervousness and still kind of keeping reserved in the back now the older pup can improve over time to come up closer but we still have that level of worry lip lick retreat ears back um, in response to those novel stimuli so a little less resiliency a little bit more challenge in the future um, and then I know we're coming close, I think, to my time. Um, so I wanted to real talk, touch real briefly on the idea of puppy classes, socialization classes. Um, my big takeaway when it comes to you guys is you guys uh, have a lot of ideas on what you can do already while the puppies are in your care. But at some point, they're going to leave your care if they happen to especially be during that socialization window. If we have any resources of appropriate, trustworthy socialization classes, this is, could, be, could be an incredible resource that we could share to that client to continue to keep that uh, puppy development going in the right direction. So puppy socialization continue to build on all the efforts that you guys are doing um, by introducing them to these novel or usual uh, uh, stimuli uh, while still um, in their developmental window. It can also be a great opportunity for those pet owners to be educated with a trusted source um, and feel they have that level of support going forward. Um, and then I, what I tend to tell my uh, veterinary clinics, if they willing, uh, are willing to do these uh, courses, is how much we can have them exposed to that environment or we can be selfish uh, and introduce procedures or things that we wished they could do in the long run in cats in particular getting comfortable to a carrier but honestly getting all of our patients used to some sort of crater confinement is going to be a valuable life skill um, as well as it can give them some guidance on things that they might not be aware of um, such as if we have dogs that were um, spring puppies maybe they didn't get exposed or, or um, any level of natural exposure to large puffy coats or uh, people of variety looks of looks and statures uh, when I think about creating a socialization class, uh, some of the caveats that we tend to think about is starting as early as seven weeks of age, with some caveats of they must have their first vaccination and vet exam within 10 days of that uh, visit. Uh, they should be dewormed, at least their first. They should be clinically healthy, no coughing, sneezing, diarrhea when they come to that class. Cats need to be FIV, FELV negative, um, and no evidence of ringworm, because we definitely don't want that to spread. Um, what I usually get with this uh, feedback is, um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So, <laughs> so some of the concerns you might have might flag in your head. I'll come back to, to some of those concerns in a minute. Um, there does tend to be a cap on who should be enrolled in some of these classes. So we shouldn't necessarily have large older dogs because um, they're starting to transition to the next developmental uh, phase that may not be the best mix when it comes to the younger pups, um, or especially cats. Once they're at 14 weeks of age, they're kind of more independent and not really open or flexible to a class setting. Um, I'm going to jump ahead, but the important piece is we want trusted resources and we want a controlled environment, both socially so that we're not terrifying our little puppies, as well as we need it to be clean. So what I usually get is a big pushback when it comes to some of the older veterinarians of don't we need to wait until they're fully vaccinated and at least in our veterinary population that means their rabies vaccine which is at 14 weeks of age 14 to 16 sorry 16 weeks of age which as I mentioned is the end of the socialization window for our our pups. Um, and so that uh, old uh, impression has been debunked um, and so what we do know with some of the recent literature is that the risk of under socialization far outweighs the risk of things like parvo especially if we're going to have socialization classes um, that are well run and hygienic um, so we find that they're not necessarily at a higher risk of developing things like parvo um, and we're much more likely to keep these dogs in their home another study looking at that with the retention rate in their particular clinic setting with just the addition of a socialization class increasing from only 33% of those dogs staying in the home up to 93%. So that's a huge retention to keep those dogs in the home. I do think I am running out of time. <laughs> am I good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if we were we were ending on on that piece. Um, I wanted to share a couple of resources that I usually share with my veterinary group uh, in the event that any of these re resources might also be valuable for you guys as well. 
Um, so there's a variety of socialization checklists. There is no one comprehensive area, but what I one that I find has been the most varied and diverse is the the checklist that was created by the late so Sophia Yin um, in her Perfect Puppy in Seven Days. Uh, really has multiple multiple pages uh, with a lot of kind of brainstorming ideas that most clients may not be aware of that they should think about when they're socializing their pet. Um, for cats, uh, I like to make sure that they're really well versed with uh, their carrier because they're going to need that uh, in the long run. I'm sure you guys have lots of uh, books and other resources, but one free one because if we can make it free and easily accessible, uh, I, want, I want to share that with the general population is uh, this book uh, by the Instinct Puppy. Uh, or Instinct uh, Dog Training and Behavior has created this puppy book over the last uh, year or so. Um, so it's kind of outlines it, but it's really simple, not a lot of text. So it's kind of easy for clients to be able to follow without kind of feeling bogged down because they're already super excited, but also really overwhelmed with their own puppy. There's a variety of videos out there. This one in particular I like is a fairly comprehensive kind of simple breakdown of general ideas of what we can think about. I can't speak to any of the other videos on this uh, YouTube channel, but I can speak to this particular video itself. And then usually my two kind of top book books for clients that are really like to read <laughs> and really want that deep uh, dive into puppies and training and socialization would be these two books. Uh, the Perfect Puppy in Seven Days, this is the one that I mentioned has that checklist, um, goes into a little bit more of a larger variety, um, less focused on kind of training and those steps, but a bit more of the general socialization piece compared to the Martin's book on Puppy Start Right, which has uh, also a bit of socialization, but is a little more rigid or, or structured when it comes to training and protocols. And then for those that really like the on online stuff, uh, the ultimate puppy uh, may be a more on their pace and their style of learning. And then I haven't forgotten my kitties. Uh, the late Dr. Sophia Yin created the Puppy Kindergarten DVD, which is some of her lectures uh, and videos on all the important things that we could teach our kittens. I do think I'm out of time, so I'm going to at least allow a little bit of time for questions. Other books, just because I wanted to make sure you all were aware of them, is the book Decoding Your Dog and Decoding Your Cat, which not only can talk about the importance of socialization, but how we could prevent the vast majority of behavior problems that I have to see. Um, and if owners could be uh, more aware of some of these concerns uh, or potentially how they could address those concerns, this could potentially help keep these pets in those homes. With that, I think I've got a couple of minutes to take questions. <laughs> 